Is the microphone needed? Probably, yeah. Probably. Okay. Let's see what we can do in a way that. Okay. Thank you, Professor Ruby Sauskas. <laughs> Not an easy name for me to learn either. But uh, it's, it's a great honor to be here. Uh, this is a very uh, well known institute, uh, successful institute. And uh, we've come across each other and each, each other's names. We have parallel research agendas. So uh, for me, it's, it's really an honor to be here. Um, what I uh, would like to uh, discuss with you it really goes to the heart of European integration theory at the moment. And that is the question. Does the EU, I should actually put it around, does the EU become ever more intergovernmental? Uh, I have the uh, privilege, like yourself, to work uh, in The Hague, and The Hague is the capital. And uh, the good thing of working in the capital is that we, you in Vilnius and I in the Netherlands, we can actually do research and interact with the uh, practitioners, the people who actually make policies, the people who operate on the shop floor of uh, European integration. And th that's a great privilege. Uh, we can really look at the, the, the micro level of European integration, where it all happens. The people who go to Brussels, participate in comitology committees, work with the European Parliament, etc. We have them very close by. That's a privilege. If you're a student in Aberdeen or in Washington, you're hundreds or thousands of miles away from where the actions actually takes place in the capitals. And uh, in The Hague, uh, one of the debates I very often have with civil servants is does the EU become more intergovernmental? And that, of course, is a very frustrating debate because the Netherlands is a small country. We rely on Europe. And we want to see a Europe in a way which is a federal Europe. Uh, we are an open economy. We need the Commission. Uh, we need rules. We need uh, uniform interpretation of the rules so that there indeed is this internal market with the control of the Commission and of the European Court of Justice. So, in a way, we are always rather federal oriented. And nowadays, what we see is, it's a big worry, that Europe becomes more intergovernmental, or as you can find <coughs> in a lot of the academic papers or newspapers, Europe is dead. We don't want Europe anymore. We don't want to be disciplined by the Commission, the Court of Justice. And there's a, a pulling back towards member states, becoming more intergovernmental. And we see the, the European Council meeting more and more often uh, every year. And, uh, few weeks, two, three weeks ago, we had two summits in one week. And so you have ever more in the governmentalism. That is, uh, seems to be the trend. And it's, to many, a very worrying trend. This debate about ever more in the governmental Europe goes back to the European, to, the 19, to 1957, the uh, Treaty of Rome, yeah, the European Economic Community being created and it lies in that treaty. It lies that Europe becomes an ever closer union between the people uh, uh, of Europe. Uh, and ever since then, we have had that question does Europe become the ever closer union? And now it's even turned around that we have the question does the EU become ever more governmental? And as I said, this is for countries an important debate, like for the Netherlands. This might be a very devastating debate. In fact, uh, France and Germany get together so often that Dutch civil servants negotiate a lot with German officials, and they think they have an understanding. But then Merkel and Sarkozy uh, have a walk on the beach in Deauville, and they take decisions which are counter to the Dutch interests. So, this really worries us in the Netherlands. So this is really the big debate in practice, but it is also the big debate called the Grand uh, Debat in, 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 in the European literature. It's about supranationalism uh, and about functionalism. Does the EU become, sorry, it's functionalism, the supranationalism, 
and intergovernmentalism or liberal intergovernmentalism. So that's the big debate in theory, but also it is the big debate that you can see in reality uh, on the ground. Uh, and my uh, view on this is uh, that this is the wrong question. Uh, it has very little to do with what is happening on the ground. In fact, this debate on supranationalism or intergovernmentalism leads to wrong answers, and it leads to answers that are actually threatening to the EU. Uh, so what I'm trying to do in this talk is setting out a new research uh, agenda, and that is that we really try to understand how supranationalism and intergovernmentalism how they hang together. What is the connection between these two? And for that, we need to have a public management approach. Public management look at the, the procedures, the mechanisms, the staff, the leadership, the budget, the planning mechanisms, at the European level and at the national level. And my thesis is that we get or at least we should get an interconnected administrative system, a multi-level interconnected uh, administrative system, with uh, administrative systems at the top, at the centre, let's think of the, and the Commission, the Council, the European Parliament. We need to understand the mechanisms there. How do they operate? How do they think? How do they plan? What sort of instruments do they use, etc.? And that's the centre, and we need to think about the administrative mechanisms at the level in the capitals. Let's say it is at this micro level of decision making at the center and in the capitals that we can see whether Europe is becoming more inter interconnected. We cannot call that supranational or intergovernmental. It is an interdependent system of European policy making. We have to understand and study the, mechan the, the, the administrative mechanisms in the EU at, and at the national level. And that is the research agenda I want to set out. Uh, let me give an example. Uh, these days, we hear a lot of people talk about if only the EU had a bazooka. You know, there's, a, uh, there's, the, there's, there's the European crisis, uh, the Euro crisis at the moment. And what do federalists, supranationalists say about uh, the, the crisis? It should have been solved. Is this going on for hours here? No, <laughs> and, yeah, it's very, probably a very criminal city. <laughs> uh, the bazooka. Federalists say, like Peter Ostan, for example, he's doing that on Dutch television very sensitive actually because we don't like that bazooka because we have to pay it. But uh, the bazooka is the sort of how do we solve the European crisis, the, the Euro crisis? Uh, it should have been done in March uh, 2010, almost two years ago already, a bit more than one year and a half ago. Had we imposed uh, a European stability mechanism, uh, the EFSF, as it is now called, uh, of let's say two billion, trillion trillion, it would have been big enough to quiet the markets. The solutions that the governments have been taking have been going very stepwise. So you see the federalists complaining about the intergovernmental Europe. Too little, too late. And now what's been decided is still very unclear. It is too little. And in the meantime, the spreads, the interest rates have gone up to the extent that solving the crisis in Greece and France becomes really expensive. So all these delays that we have because of this intergovernmental uh, cooperation in the last one year and a half has really damaged the EU and Europe. That's the reasoning of the, 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 the supranationalist. I think that reasoning and actually, I, I heard an economist on the, the television a few days ago saying, I am an economist, so I am right. This is the truth, I am telling you. Economists are always very good at telling the truth. Uh, so the federalist economists say, we needed the bazooka, 
And now Europe is in certain dire straits because of intergovernmentalism. Now this whole idea that had we had a bazooka, now the Euro crisis would have been solved, I think is a very dangerous assumption. Because had we had a bazooka a year and a half ago, had we followed Kievan Ostad and the supranationalist, we might as well be now in Europe in a much bigger crisis than we are now. Because we had paid a huge fund, countries would not have gone to adapt themselves as they are doing now. All the countries are now adapting themselves. It's crisis in Belgium, in France, even in the Netherlands, although we do reasonably well at the moment. It is because we see the whole turmoil of the Europe being crisis heading towards us. So Greece, Italy, Spain, Portugal, France, the Netherlands, Belgium, we are all adapting our systems to the crisis. This would probably not have happened had we had the bazooka. You see, what has happened in the meantime in the crisis? People think, well, so little has happened, too little and too late. In fact, what we can see is, think of this public administrative system that I was talking about, with the central and national levels being really interconnected. You saw major changes. Rules have been adapted, uh, the six pack, uh, the Euro Plus Pact, rules about the economy, rules about uh, budgets. Um, Parliament has adapted, the European Parliament has adapted, it has created new committees looking at the Euro crisis. Uh, national parliaments have adapted, setting up new systems. Um, the Commission has proposed new rules. The Commission, we even now have an independent commissioner on the grain uh, as commissioner to monitor the economic and budgetary measures that are taken in the member states. Um, uh, national member states have imposed new rules. Let's look at Germany or Spain, which have in now in the constitution the, 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 the obligation to have a balanced budget, for example. So what we have seen over the past one year and a half, a bit more, is an adaptation of rule systems, an adaptation of the institutions, an adaptation of the way parliaments, European national, operate, ministries operate. And that is the, in the meantime, that is where the solution of the Euro crisis will come from. Because now we get the whole economy under control. We get ministries, countries working together. We now even have debates in our national parliament about adapting the need to adapt in Belgium. Now that would have been unheard of two years ago, to have a debate on another country. Because we don't want other countries to discuss us and criticize the very good Dutch economy, although we have certain holes in our economy, but we do not want that to be addressed by the Commission, by the Member State. So we see that the, the mechanisms, the institutions that we have, are changing. Now that is the basis to actually now work on solving the Euro crisis. Imposing a bazooka one year and a half ago would have completely failed. <coughs> and this tells us something about this macro debate. And that is the macro debate that we have between the grant policies uh, between intergovernmentalism and supranationalism. Now, does the EU become more intergovernmental or does it become more supranational? And we are believers, so some believe that we should become more supranational in the government, and that is where we find the solutions. For example, a stronger commission or a stronger uh, intergovernmental European Council. But it is actually at these administrative mechanisms that we have to look what is really happening in European integration. And that is the research agenda that I think that we now need. And that is where I think we work at Living Capitals we can actually study what's happening in Brussels, but also see how our capitals, our parliaments, our ministries are changing their rules, their operating mechanisms. And that's, I think, what we need to study in order to actually understand whether Europe becomes more intergovernmental or more uh, federal. And my assumption is that we become more supranational and intergovernmental at the same time. In fact, I need to go a step further. We cannot go, become, we cannot become more supranational 
without becoming more intergovernmental too. As I just explained, we cannot impose a bazooka without adapting first the whole administrative structures and political structures that we need to have. So, supranationalism and intergovernmentalism are part of this administrative system. It's just what angle you look at it. And that you have to change them at the same time in order to move forward with European integration. Federalists will not like this remark because they want to see, like Peter Hofstadt, he wants to see a stronger Europe, a stronger European Parliament, a stronger Commission. But that cannot go without stronger national administrative systems. And the research agenda, if you're students, you have to write master thesis. This is the micro level you have to look at. What is changing in Europe? What is changing in your capital? And do these changes match each other? And if they don't, you have an analytical tool to actually understand where and why Europe fails. Uh, I said uh, federalists will not like this, intergovernmentalists will not like it either. Because, of course, next to cooperation between the member states, adaptation at the national level, we also need the supranational institutions. So it is a system, and that is the thing that public management, public administration tells us. You have to be able to see the EU from a systemic perspective. If not, you fail to see the problems. And this is why a lot of the academics who write about European integration give very bad advice about how to go on with Europe, or for example, solving the Euro crisis. That is basically the story I wanted to say. Uh, but I'm still at the introduction. Uh, and the same applies to Ashton. I hope you understand, you know, with the bazooka that I thought we could look at the EU crisis, see where it failed. Well, it failed because of the administrative system, both at the central level and the decentral level, were not geared up towards the tasks of the EU. We did not have an interconnected administrative system. Ashton. Is Ashton, let's assume Ashton is uh, a development to a supranational cooperation. Ashton, the Ashton is the high representative for foreign policy and security policy. So, in a way, it's a sort of starting off for a European Ministry for Foreign Relations and a European Defence uh, Ministry. Now, <coughs> my prediction would be well, let me first say that what I come across in the literature is that people actually tell us that this should be more supranational. And the problem is that we do not have enough of Ashton. And we, should be, we should have more European structures. In order for Ashton to succeed, to have a credible uh, foreign policy of the EU, we should have stronger institutions. And the conclusion is, at the national level, countries should reduce their efforts, their policies, their institutions in foreign relations. In the Netherlands, we now have the debate that Ashton should have gone to Israel, and we should not have had a Dutch policy on that. That would be now the European policy. Now, you see, so in, here you see the tension between it is more supranational and less national. That system will break down. My prediction is that in order for Ashton to succeed, we need to study her institutions, her staff, her units how they operate, how they plan their budgets, etc. But at the same time, look at the parallel developments to support these developments in the national capitals. So do we see the emergence of an administrative system around Ashton with both capacities at the European level as well as at the national level? And my prediction would be that we see, as Ashton grows and develops, which I, I guess she will, we see that that also implies changes at the national level. Not less national level, but in fact, a national level adapted to the roles and tasks that are taking place in Brussels. It's a fundamentally different perspective. So you have to be able to, to study the administrative developments in the Euro as well as in Ashley. Uh, other example I can talk about is uh, the European Parliament. The European Parliament becomes more important. 
Lisbon has added many new areas to the responsibilities of the European Parliament. We have that more co-decision, or as it's called, the ordinary uh, procedure. Uh, but that is not the only story. If that were the only story, we would see the European Parliament becoming stronger and national parliaments become weaker. But actually, if you look carefully, you will see that national parliaments are now adapting themselves strongly to European integration. But we at the same time also see national parliaments, probably also here, but that's for you to study, becoming more strongly oriented towards the EU. So at the same time, we see this development in the European Parliament, but we can also see national parliaments becoming more actively involved in European policy. And this also has to go together, because otherwise we would have legitimacy defined at the European level, not at the national level. That would probably not be accepted anywhere. So again, you see a system developing with more of a center and more of the national level. So it's that systems perspective that I want to get. And that is the systems perspective that we need to start to study in order to see that Europe is not something in Brussels, but it's the fact in us. But also when the Euro or Europe as a whole breaks down, this is the analytical level where we can look for where did it go wrong. Um, commission impact assessment systems. Like the Commission was in a very poor situation about uh, 10, 15 years ago. In 1999, the Commission was in such a bad shape that the Commission Center actually had to step down. Policies of the Commission were regarded as being absolutely of poor quality. Um, people did not have trust in the Commission. Now, that is an erosion of the supranational model. What the Commission has been doing, and Barroso has been very uh, important in this development, the Commission has transformed itself. And the Commission is now, I would dare to say, the best administration in Europe. We think the Commission is weak, and you know, poor bastards who work there, but in fact, it is the most transparent, best planned administrative system that we have in Europe. It's better than the Dutch administrative system. Um, and we think we're very good. Uh, but many of the mechanisms that the Commission has put in place do not really work. For example, there's an impact assessment system that the Commission has to plan its policies, to elaborate its policies. But in order for this impact assessment system to work, you need to have a national system of impact assessment systems, which feeds into the Commission impact assessment system, right? If the Commission wants to know how a policy affects countries, the countries need to tell the Commission how that will happen. So the Commission impact assessment assessment system only works if member states create parallel and similar impact assessment systems. Now one of the reasons that we have 15 years of discussions about impact assessment systems in the Commission and why they are not successful is not because the Commission makes mistakes, but because it is not connected to impact assessment systems at the national level. The Commission doesn't like this remark. I have had this debate quite often with Commission officials. Commission officials want to write impact assessments by themselves. But they say, we have the right of initiatives. We don't want member states to look over our shoulders. Member states say, we don't want to have the Commission impact assessment system. Let the Commission do the job. It's their responsibility. Why should we think for the Commission? We are already so busy. So you see that both parties move away from each other, and as a consequence, we have impact assessment systems at the European level and at the national level, which do not interact. Hence, all the efforts at the European level and at the national level to create impact assessment systems are very ineffective because they do not communicate towards each other. Hence, the Commission has great difficulties deciding on things like effects of instruments, effects of subsidiarity, proportionality. You need to think in terms of integrated administrative systems. Very unfortunate, but it needs to be done. 
So what we need to do in order to stand, understand what's happening in Europe, whether we become more intergovernmental or more supranational, really depends on whether we will start mapping the micro changes at the institutional level, both in Brussels and the national level, and how these systems inter interact. And that's why we need to have this public management agenda next to the uh, big debate agenda. <coughs> To the picture. This is our Prime Minister, Mark Rutte. Uh, this is about a year ago, October uh, last year, his first uh, European summit, where he met Barroso. This is the meeting where they first met. Actually, do you think our Prime Minister walks up to Bar Barroso or actually walks away? <laughs> he seems to walk away. It is a rather telling picture. Because this is what is happening in, in the Netherlands. We are lost in Europe. Um, we really don't like the Commission anymore. What I can see in the past five years is five years ago, people were telling me the Commission is our best friend. Uh, 2004, I was heavily involved in, like, uh, and almost now in the, the, the Dutch presidency. And, and you were preparing for it now. I was working then with the Dutch administration. There was commission here, commission there, commission best friend, etc. Not anymore. We don't like the commission. We don't like Barroso. We don't trust the guy. Um, don't ask me why, because I, I think we're lost. But this goes so far that the, he is actually been turning the commission around into a very well oiled machine. And that's something that we forget to see how important he has been in that respect. We have not adapted, for example, our impact assessment systems to the operations of the Commission. In fact, we have been working over the past uh, 10 years heavily on our own national planning for policy procedures and impact assessment systems. We have over 110 tests that need to be done when we write a new policy, completely independent from the Commission procedures for writing new policies. There is a breakdown between Dutch officials and Commission officials. The Commission officials now think more in terms of impact assessment, planning, roadmap, and all the rest. I hope you look at it because it is important that you look at the micro changes, how policies are made in these organizations. At the national level, we have our own system. The planning of policies is different. The logics of how we formulate policies is different and therefore the communication between policies, between the Commission and national officials, is breaking down. Uh, whenever there's trouble with the Commission, they come to us, <laughs> this is our role, and we probably like you here. Uh, around, uh, in spring, between the Commission and our um, uh, Ministry of Transport, over something with water. And then I can just see, they don't know anymore how the Commission operates. They don't know how to use language like subsidiarity, proportionality, impact assessment, what have you. We do not follow it, what happened in the Commission, and we cannot work with it. So all we are left of is to say, these Commission officials are so arrogant. No, it's a breakdown in communication system. Hence, again, you see that this administrative system that I think we need in Europe is not being established. And that is what we researchers should be looking at. Not have vague and abstract debates about supranational federal. We should see how these systems interact. And how we see that they, the Commission becomes more supranational, becomes better. But we, at the intergovernmental level, move in different directions. This is where Europe breaks down. And that's what you see in the picture. Because he doesn't like Barroso, he is not telling his staff to actually operate very much like the Commission. Communication breaks down. So, it's an uh, ambitious agenda that I want to, 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 to sell. But we need to study the micro level <coughs> decision making. How ministries, parliaments, at European and national level are changing, and how these changes interconnect or not. If they don't, the Europe falls apart. That's what we see. This is what I call the micro foundation of macro trends. And for those of you who study economics, two years ago, uh, a couple of economists got the Nobel Prize for their study on the micro-foundations of macroeconomics. In fact, that is what we need to do in political science too, that we have to study the micro-trends 
how institutions change, how the administrative system becomes a European system, interconnected, not to have one administrative system. In order to understand the developments at the macro level, does the EU become more intergovernmental effective? So, a micro foundation, looking at the micro trends that we can do in the capitals, of the macro trends, that's what we need to do. Uh, I don't have much time to do it, but I still have left. Uh, because this was just an introduction. <laughs> uh, okay, now, to continue with the story, this was just the introduction, but we have already one paper, uh, we've already covered one paper. Um, we have to look at the macro trends, both in reality, which is the question about ever more in the governmental or ever more federal supranational union. I assume you're all familiar with new functionalism and the liberal intergovernmentalism, so I will cover that. Uh, but we do have to see that this question about ever more intergovernmental in Europe. The conclusion seems to be, at least from what I read in newspapers, academic papers, and, and the media, is that Europe becomes more intergovernmental. And some go as far as to say that the Europe is dying. Um, we see the same trend in the theoretical debate about the EU. That uh, debate about neo-functionalism and liberal intergovernmental theory seems to conclude that state led theories, intergovernmental theories, are actually winning over the neo-functional theories. So what we see in reality in debates about does the EU become intergovernmental is paralleled by the debate about uh, in, in academia that the EU becomes more intergovernmental. I just learned that uh, Professor Philippe Sauskas is writing a paper that the EU is actually becoming, if I'm correct, more uh, supranational because we see fiscal fiscal federalism becoming important. So we still have those debates in what direction, but basically it's in the government, in reality and in theory. I think that's wrong because we cannot have any other system than both at the same time. I just so the macro trends I want to say a few words about and the micro trends and that would be, say, let's pick one of the institutions, we could pick the European Parliament, look at the changes in and around the European Parliament, and look at how those translate to changes in and around the national parliaments. But I want to discuss the Commission. Does the Commission become weaker or stronger? And then look at the impact assessment system. And then you can really see at the micro level an administrative system developing. And where it fails it is because the system doesn't become a European system. So that's what I would like to do. A uh, question that I've already covered a lot of that is uh, why for 15 years has the Commission Impact Assessment System failed? Because you know, that would be part of supranationalism, the Commission becoming more strong, but it failed because of this lack of administrative system. It is important what we're talking about. Why has the Lisbon process failed? We have had the Lisbon process. Many would say it's an intergovernmental process, which was supposed to make the European economies more competitive by the year 2010. It is now concluded as a complete failure. And as a result of that failure, we now have the Euro crisis. Italy has never adapted itself. Greece, on the world ranking of the competitiveness of nations, Every country is on that list. Uh, I don't know where Lithuania is. I guess it would be quite high, 20 something, I would guess. 40. 40? Ooh, there's a lot of work to do for you. <laughs> Greece is on place 86. <laughs> and on 85, we have Cameroon. You know, I don't need the Lisbon process to see that European economies have failed. But why has the Lisbon process failed? Because nobody really studied it as an interconnected administrative system with roles and responsibilities of the Commission and matching roles and responsibilities at the national level and the, uh, the design of the networks. It is at that nitty-gritty level that we have to understand these processes. Well, nobody did, I did. 
and I predicted in 2004 that the Lisbon process will never succeed because there is no system to make it work. Political scientists who talk in terms of federal union or intergovernmental union, political scientists, they believe in power, in conflict. They don't want to study institutional changes, resources, rules, budgets, leadership. They think in terms of interest, clashes, power. The Lisbon process is really important to study because we now have what's called a semester in order to make the euro more competitive. And that also applies to countries like yourself, not part of the euro, because the internal market will only succeed if member states have competitive economies. So that you buy our products, etc., and vice versa. The first semester has almost gone unnoticed. We haven't learned the lessons. And for the semester to succeed, we need to look at what is the role of national parliaments? Which European <coughs> networks are involved? What kind of leadership does these networks have? What is the role of the Commission in all of that? Which national departments in all of that? If you will go down the list of administrative requirements for the Lisbon process or the semester process to work, you would come against the whole range of checks that we have to put into place. They never existed for the Lisbon process, hence the failure. And we go on with the semester, and so far I'm not convinced that we will succeed. It's very important that we get that on the agenda. European statistics. Very boring topic. Just figures in the book. But in order for these figures to get into the books, you actually have to have a European administrative system. The Commission, we were just talking about it over lunch, the Commission asked me in 1999 to assess the quality of European statistical data. The conclusions of the report in 1999 were the data of Italy, Greece, and Portugal are completely unreliable. Not a little bit, completely unreliable. One of the reasons is that everybody just thought, okay, Greek data, we don't trust them as long as nobody looks at our data. Because our Dutch data, for example, are so good. We don't want anybody from Brussels to come and look at our data. They are fabulous, they are reliable. So we did not build a European system for statistical data. Now the consequence has been absolutely clear. Uh, the, the lack of reliable data was one of the fundamental problems that we now have with the Euro. We don't have an administrative system. And political scientists are not even beginning to look at what a reliable statistical system would look like from an organizational perspective. Uh, it's very bad at the moment. Um, the Eurostat directive about reliability of data is now being reviewed. But nobody is really looking at is Eurostat an independent organization, for example. Are national statistical data authorities independent institutions? All of those questions are not in the current directive that is now on the table to be renegotiated. It is unbelievably stupid. I can only be very negative about that. Lack of European leadership. How often do I hear political scientists talk about lack of political leadership? If you would understand how organizations work, and if you would go in any area and look at leadership people, you would find a lot of leadership actually in the European Union. Uh, anyways, that's for more for the day. But if you if you understand the organization, if you would understand if you were able to understand the EU from this interconnected organizational system, you would see that there is a lot of leadership in the EU. Yet, I hear many people complain about lack of leadership. The impression that creates in the press for the public is that Europe is just a disaster because there's not enough leadership. The opposite is true. There's a lot of leadership. Anyways, you have to be able to, to, to play with you have to be able to analyze organizational structures in Europe. Ah, I will skip the last one. 
Why is it important? I think already I've said a lot of things about why I think this is important that we can actually analyze how national and European systems interact. Uh, for one thing, this is comes for the Netherlands, and I'm sure it applies in other countries. There's a lot of confusion about for is the EU becoming more intergovernmental or more supranational? We see that in the in the papers, the public doesn't know anymore what to expect from you. And we are worried that we are, our national systems are not part of it anymore. Uh, you can hear people talk about, oh, it's only Merkel who now decides. Uh, or it's the Commission, or it's Brussels. I think it's important that we bring out that in many of the developments, our national administrations are actually very keenly and strongly involved in the processes. Because this perception is wrong that it is either intergovernmental and led by Merkel, or supranational led by Brussels. No, it's a system in which, for example, the Netherlands is very strongly involved. We can explain the public better how <coughs> Europe functions if we would get at this administrative agenda. So it will solve a lot of the confusion that exists. Uh, supranationalism is better. Uh, I just already said that this applies to the people who think that we should have had the bazooka, a supranational solution, a year and a half ago. Well, if you don't understand, if, as I just explained, had we had a bazooka without the whole system being in place that we're now building into place, the problems would have been much bigger than they are now. So it is important that we understand the systems and that we're able to analyze it from its organizational perspective in order to cut through such easy remarks that if only we had uh, more supranationalism, if only the Commission would buy euro bonds, uh, etc. Lobbying. Um, when, when I'm in uh, talk, talk to uh, civil service in The Hague, they now want to see that the influence of the Netherlands in Europe becomes stronger. And one reason, or one issue that we look at, is that we want to have stronger representation of the Netherlands in the capitals, so stronger embassies. You see that the that the lobbying agenda of the Netherlands is shifting towards the intergovernmental agenda. Whereas in fact, this is the sort of self-created image of Europe becoming more intergovernmental, that we start to lobby more in the capitals. Whereas no, the Commission is becoming stronger, but we don't see that part of the agenda. But we should also adapt our national coordination mechanisms, the impact assessment system, all the rest of to, to, to adapt the changes in Brussels, and that means a lot of our lobbying depends on how we reform our national administration and our national coordination mechanisms. So you see how, if you understand the EU from its organizational perspective, you also get different kinds of solutions, how you lobby in Brussels. I will skip that point. Um, diagnosing the problems in order to understand, for example, why impact assessment fails, why the euro system broke down, we really have to move beyond this debate between intergovernmentalism, supranationalism. We have to understand it as one system, one cannot without the other. So it is important to diagnose problems. Um, in theory, uh, I'll skip that. The reality. This is a picture that I took from The Economist two years ago because it is the picture that really shows how we perceive what is now going on. Um, uh, the crisis broke out. France was the presidency, the council. And, uh, Sarkozy, he's a very active person, as you know, uh, his private agenda was he actually wanted to visit Camp David. He'd never been to Camp David and he is the president of France, and he thought, I have to be in Camp David once in my life. <coughs> Fortunately, there's now this crisis going on. He ran out of the literally, and he said, we need to talk. He completely took everybody by surprise. This was the presidency acting on its own. And then Barroso said, this is ridiculous. You cannot go without me. So Barroso really wanted to join uh, <laughs> Sarkozy on this trip to Camp David. <laughs> So this is, you know, this is really sort of 
Europe becoming, you see, this is what the pictures are, Europe becomes intergovernmental, and the Commission just tags along. That's the impression we have. Um, then they came uh, at Camp David, and they were from the car, taken by this golf cart thing. And uh, unfortunately, there's only one person who can sit next to uh, Bush. So, Barroso was so stupid to go and sit in the back. And this picture went all over the world. And we see this sort of nice and shiny public with his shoes and his, you know, his matching socks. He made it up really ludicrous. But this is the image we now all seem to have. Uh, and I don't have to go over it, but you know, it has to do with the Commission. The European Council becoming more important, Van Rompuy becoming more important, others like Ashton taking powers away from him, the Commission is here. That is the sort of public impression. And it is a dangerous one for smaller countries like the Netherlands and Lithuania. I will skip that. In, in academic debate, we see the same thing happening in this picture. That's the reality. We see the commission on the back of this golf cart and Sarkozy in front, the council leading. The academic debate about does the EU become more the ever closer union, that's the what's debate is called. We see state-centric models winning. All the quotes there actually point to the same that intergovernmentalism is more strong than neo-functionalism. Importantly, if you read the literature carefully, it is about the continuum. It is about more federalism versus more supranationalism. Rome, they can only exist together. That's a very fundamental point. This is the grand debate in uh, European integration. It's about ever closer union. And it's in the wrong terms because people don't understand how the European institutions or the European administrative system works. So it's about more this or more that. It is not about the interdependence between the two. That's important. We are here really criticizing the big debate in European integration, which is fought on this battle between is it either this or either that. That's very dangerous that this academic debate is so superficial. Actually, it's about competing theories in a way. If you look at the literature, it's really one against the other. It is not about the independence between the two. Very fundamental criticism on the core debate in European integration studies. Some are very clever in the debate, like Ben Rosen on the Philip Schmitter, which you all should know. They actually say, okay, there's a connection between the two, but what? How do these theories click into place? How do these theories relate to each other? Philip Schmidt makes another remark and he says, this, this grand debate is under theorized. It's the political scientists who have you know, high blood theories about neo functionalism and new functionalism, whatever have you. But actually, it is under theorized. What is missing is the systems perspective that only the organizational, the public administration, a gentleman can bring. Uh, and what I would argue is that we need those theories as a concept. It's not one or the other, but it's both at the same time. Now, the micro developments. Go back to this. This was the picture that I showed uh, of the Commission, the micro level, the institution, how it works internally, seems to be eroded. Now, this is from the same press conference, but taken from Barroso's own website. Um, and here you see Barroso as the grand man. And actually, the world leaders looking very seriously at him while he speaks. This is the impression that he creates of himself. And I think he's partly right there. Because the Commission truly is a hotbed of reform. It is one of the, I already said it, it is one of the best administrations we have. I can't go into detail, but if you would look at the organization itself, so really look at the micro level, you can see that it works less hard and less but better policies. 
You have to ask them to come back and I will deal with that. Uh, it does impact assessments. And with these impact assessments, the Commission has gained a lot of influence in the European Parliament, but also in the national Parliament. Commission proposals in the past were looked at as political documents. You know, how does the Commission come at its information? That was always one of the debates when the Commission sent a proposal to the Council of the European Parliament. The presidency always had to devote a lot of time first on, well, where does the data come from? Now we have impact assessments, the data are, are there. Also, uh, uh, the, what used to happen in the past is that the Council and the European Parliament would criticize the Commission. Well, you only present this with one option. Why didn't you spend, why didn't you choose for that option or that option? With the impact assessments, these options are there. So you can see actually that the Commission has gained a lot of influence and that's been tried and tested. Presidentialization. Barroso is a strong internal leader in the Commission. Under Prodi, for example, commissioners were often fighting heavily against each other. Open and in public. Under Barroso, even in very difficult times, there's very few open fights between commissions. He runs a tight ship. Importantly, there are 27 commissioners. People thought he can never run a commission with a college of 27 commissioners. Remember that debate? He actually manages. So he has, he, he became more of a presidential figure himself. Uh, I go on and on. He really uh, reformed the commission into a, a good organization. So I actually grant him this picture. He's been criticized for only listening to to small, uh, to, 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 to big countries. Well, in fact, when he was re-elected two years ago, during his election campaign, he had to fight illegal state aid, for example, from France to Renault and from Germany to Opel. I was reading in the newspapers, uh, the commission becomes poor and weak, and Barroso only listens to the big member states, and I would flip the page the Commission attacks Opel and the German government and the Commission forbids France to state for state aid to Renault. You know, he was going really after the big countries. He did it. Many other examples I can mention, but the Commission is a strong organization. The national administrations have not followed the Commission reforms. And therefore the Commission reforms are bound to be not so successful as they should be. We, we fail to see the interdependence between the Commission as an organization and what's happening in the capitals, the Hague, Vilnius, etc., etc. So, well, I let me skip this, but if, you, if we would compare the Commission reform agenda, the administrative reform, to the Dutch administrative reform agenda, you could see that there is very little interconnection between the two. And that is why a lot of the failures that we see are there. And as I said, this is where the crisis comes from. This is why statistical data are unreliable, why impact assessments do not play the role they ought to play. So the conclusions, I hope I'm on time, is uh, uh, we have to we have to really start to study Europe at a more detailed level. We should stop having such macro, grand theory debates about intergovernmentalism and supranationalism. We work in capitals. We have access to the people who actually work at the shop floor of European integration. We should use that. It's probably not a surprise that the grand theories, as they are designed, are designed in the United States. These people have to be so highbrow and theoretical because they haven't got access to the decision making. But that's our contribution that we can understand and study the EU really as an integrated organization, a multi level organization, <coughs> where one level cannot do without the other. And I think we need to pick up that agenda pretty fast because otherwise we will not get out of the euro crisis. Uh, what's all the other crisis that we have.
So I think it's an important uh, it, it's an important debate that we study this multi-level organizational system that the EU now is becoming. And I would like to leave it on that. Thank you. Thank you.